Hello, my name is Pete Knorr. I'm one of the advisors at Bogart Wealth. And today we're covering the topic of retirement income planning. First, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction to Bogart Wealth for those who haven't met us before. And then we'll save the vast majority of the time for the actual topic. And this diagram on the cover I will get back to that in just a couple of slides. So Bogart Wealth is a registered investment advisor. What that means is in the investment advice world, there's two, two kinds of advisors, ones that work for a bank and ones who are independent of the bank. And therefore there's no other relationship other than you and us, okay? Uh, now, our clients have their assets at a bank, uh, a custodian. We use Charles Schwab. Uh, they were the original low-cost brokerage, uh, and they're the biggest in terms of having registered investment advisors. So we're registered directly with the Securities and Exchange Commission. We have a fiduciary duty uh, in all that we do. I'll get back to the definition of fiduciary in just a minute. We have not quite $2 billion of assets. Well, our clients have $2 billion of assets. Um, and we have a little over 900 households, most of which 90% or so of our clients are major oil company retirees. And where it says major oil company, you can read Exxon Mobil and you're going to be right. Uh, okay, so what does a fiduciary mean? It means that we must always act in good faith and put the client's interest first. If there are any conflicts of interest, we have the legal obligation to disclose all of them fully. Uh, of course, we need to have transparent fees, not be misleading. Uh, okay, so this is most of the company. I say most because, well, you know, things are changing in a dynamic world. Uh, so if you've been to the Hughes Landing office and you probably notice that Sydney's been promoted up to a associate financial advisor and her replacement, Asima, we don't have her picture up here yet. Um, so that's why I say most of the companies there. We also have a tax team, uh, Troy Callahan, CPA, and his associates, so we can handle soup to nuts on the tax side of things. We have three locations. You tell me whether they're convenient or not. The company really started out in McLean, Virginia just a couple of freeway exits north of Gallows Road, if that address means anything to you. And at some point, figured out that Gallows Road was not going to be a mobile or Exxon mobile facility much longer. Came down to Houston to see whether or not people in Houston would be interested in having an advisor in Virginia. I'm one of the first uh, that they found. So I was an Exxon Mobil employee. And when I decided to retire, they asked me if I wanted to join them. I said, no, my wife said yes. And here I am years later uh, at the Houston, West Houston office. Uh, and then of course, well, we realized we needed to have an office near the spring campus. And so our third office is in the Woodlands. And happy to meet at uh, Houston or the Woodlands. Be kind of extraordinary for me to meet with you in McLean. Uh, our mission is to help clients achieve financial peace of mind by preserving and maximizing intergenerational wealth. So a lot of times the big uncertainties in somebody's plan is their children or their parents. And so the, the whole family that you're interested in, we're interested in helping you with. And our not 
at all hidden objective of doing these informational webinars is to convince you, you ought to come in and talk to us one-on-one -on -one for financial strategy. Uh, you know, in these webinars, we can cover general topics, but it's really, really hard to get down to individual situations. Uh, but having said that, I have the Q&A box open. I have the chat box open. So if you have questions about anything I say as we go through this, uh, post them in either place. And as I notice them, I will try to address them. So this retirement income planning is one of these retirement readiness seminars that we do. The original was Retirement Planning Timeline. Uh, it covers like every topic of retirement planning, but only about an inch deep. And the rest of these then sort of drill down. So this one is kind of the second one we ever did, which is a drill down into income planning. But these others are of interest as well, we do them a little bit less often. So security planning, tax planning, particularly when there's tax law changes, we tend to update that. Estate planning strategies, NUA and other post-retirement strategies, long-term care, Roth versus traditional and mega backdoor Roth strategies. Um, there's actually another one that we do quite often that's not even listed here. And that is how do discount rates affect your ExxonMobil lump sum. Uh, and I'm quite sure I'll be doing one of those again pretty soon because they just published the January, I'm sorry, they just published the February uh, segmented rates on the IRS website yesterday. And that's generally my, uh, my cue for up time to do that seminar again. Okay, so here we are. We've just finished the introductions. Uh, next, I'm going to do the overview of why retirement income planning, why is it important, and then get into our four-step planning process for retirement income. Okay, so why do retirement income planning? Well, if you have a plan, it'll help you to understand what are the risks that retirees are going to face and then plan for and hopefully minimize those risks. Uh, and to the extent the choices have to be made, you can then make informed choices for funding your retirement. And hopefully that will lead you to a predictable income during retirement. Um, Okay, so a question just came up about how much of a haircut does one take if they're retiring uh, before reaching 55 and 15. Uh, let me put that off to where I'm talking about how much of a haircut you take at 55 and 15, and then I can sort of expand that for you and put it into context. So continue with why retirement income planning. So basically we're looking to achieve sustainable withdrawal rates and appropriate withdrawal strategy. So I'll talk about what those things mean and then monitor and plan, uh, adjust things as adjustments might be needed. Okay, so part of this is you creating your own vision of what you want your future to be. Uh, because everybody's in a little bit different situation in terms of like family, their health, their home. So there are people who are like, I'm looking for what's the right age for me to retire. And there's other people who are, I need to retire now because either my health or my spouse's health or my parents' health and I don't really have a choice about this, so help me figure out how it's going to work. And these are sort of two very different ways to come at retirement planning. Um, and then, you know, there's people who intend to live where they are. And there's people who intend to move. There's people who already own that second property and 
now they're going to sell what had been their primary residence. There's other people who don't have that second property yet. There's other people who are going to maintain two properties. Uh, so everybody's situation is a little bit different. Everybody's lifestyle is a little bit different. There are some hobbies that you have that you know you're going to stop doing uh, at a certain age, okay? Like if you're a pilot, you could be pretty darn sure you won't be doing that at 90 years old. Uh, some people, their idea of a good retirement includes some form of work. Looks like I'm one of those. Uh, a legacy is really important to some people and there are other people who are last dollar, last breath is sounds like a good plan to them. And then, you know, mind and spirit. There are definitely people who tell me in retirement that they're bored and they're looking for work to do. And there's other people who, this is probably the majority, they say they're so busy, they have no idea how they ever had time to work before. Okay, this is from a survey where people could pick multiple things that they thought were important goals of them in retirement. And... I say that because if you look at the percentage responses, they add up to a lot more than 100%. So people pick more than one thing. But when asked to, to rate their goals in retirement, the number one was a secure, reliable income. The second, an income that keeps up with inflation, not worrying about having enough money, helping out children and grandchildren financially. And finally, we get down to something that was not financial. So retirement is about a lot more than just the finances, but you'll pardon me if from now this slide on, that's all I'm gonna talk about is money. Okay, so risks in retirement that everybody faces. Longevity is one. And it, it, this is always kind of an interesting conversation when uh, you know the client says to me, but you know, I'm worried about uh, you know what happens if I if I die young, and I say, well, that's interesting because I'm really worried about what happens if you live a long time. So uh, there is about a 50% chance for a couple who's already at age 65. There's about a 50% chance that one of them will make it to 90. Uh, there's a 20% chance one will live to 95 and about a 4% chance that one of them is going to live to 100, okay? Now, a question uh, came up, how many ExxonMobil clients does Bogart Wealth have? And I, I covered that, well, actually, it was how many ExxonMobil clients do we have? So uh, it's on this slide where we said it's, it's over 900 families, and at least 90% of them are major oil company, which I said, you can read those words to mean ExxonMobil. Okay, so longevity is, is a big risk. Inflation, of course, is a big risk. And, uh, you know, maybe I should have updated this slide instead of using 3% inflation used uh, 5% inflation, but okay. So basically it's going to cut your purchasing power in about half, or the way you really see this in the plan we're running is that if you're spending a hundred thousand now, then, you know, 30 years from now, it's, it's 200,000. And, you know, if you're getting 30,000 in social security now, it becomes 60, it becomes 90. Um, okay. Market performance and the sequence of returns matters as long as you're not going to live forever. That uh, having bad outcomes in the first few years of retirement is clearly much worse. And the way to understand that is if you remember the magic of dollar cost averaging while you're working and putting money into an account about the same amount every paycheck, uh, what simple algebra will demonstrate to you is that you have bought 
below the average cost of any period of time if there was volatility at all in the market. And it's like, it's a miracle. Uh, but obviously in the market, every time somebody has a good thing happen to them, then somebody had a not as good thing happening to them. So the exact same math would show you that if you're pulling out a given amount of money every month from your savings and there's volatility, that you sold at below average market price over any given period of time. So if you have to sell while the markets are going down, um, that's a risk. And then of course, healthcare. Now the not intuitive thing about this is, yeah, yeah, healthcare costs are rising. But once you're 65, you're on Medicare, you've got subsidized health care by the government. And while that doesn't sound like a good thing, people who are on Medicare are like, keep your hands off my Medicare. So they actually like it. And you have that plus your, your Medicare supplement. Nah, it's not a supplement plan anymore. It's an advantage plan. But anyway, as an ExxonMobil retiree, you have that, that coverage. You're not gonna spend more and you're out of pocket spendable. You know, healthcare cost rising is not the big issue. The big issue is long-term care. That is things that are not covered by ordinary health care. And, and for sure, those costs are going up. Okay, so we can use historical averages for inflation and other people's spending and that sort of thing. But there really is no such thing as an average retirement. We really need to work hand in hand with you to come up with a plan that really covers you and your family and your needs. Uh, in terms of your spending profile, what kinds of assets you have, uh, qualified versus after-tax assets that affect your tax rates, what lifespans do you want to plan for? Uh, uh, you know, we can use averages for inflation, and then we can we can test that against different scenarios. And the same thing with investment returns. So for us, retirement income planning is a process. And the first part is what we call the retirement analysis. So I'm going to cover that first. Uh, investment planning and withdrawal strategy. Now, when I'm working with clients, I generally actually say, let's talk about withdrawal strategy first and back into investment strategy. But that's not the way this uh, slide deck is put together. So we're going to cover investment strategy and then talk about withdrawal strategy and then monitor and review. So uh, those are the four parts of this talk. And let's get into step one is analyzing your retirement needs. So prioritizing your goals, setting expectations on how you're going to achieve them. Uh, a lot of people, they come in, the first thing they say is, well, let's just try to replace my paycheck, please. Um, and, and I say, well, we can start there, but sooner or later, you're gonna see that you really want to think more about your income needs because you probably got a bucket list of things to do early in retirement, which may slow down after like 75 or 80 and may slow down even more after, I don't know, 85, 90, okay? Um, so a question came up, if this is a cycle, how often, uh, should you complete the cycle? And so what I would say is when we're initially working with people, it's going to take us several iterations to get step one to where we want it. Okay. But once someone is a client, we're generally looking at updating this maybe once a year, maybe only once every couple of years, but certainly when there's market upsets, <laughs> people almost naturally now draw to the question of, okay, let's review my withdrawal strategy and see whether or not 
everything still looks copacetic. Okay. Um, so then there are choices that people have about their lifestyle. Uh, it's, it's really nice to break your expenses into the categories of things you absolutely need and things that, you know, yeah, you want and, uh, and that, you know, you may want the, the price or the spending of these categories to go up just as fast as these categories, but you've already sort of pre-planned that, all right, if things aren't going the way we had planned them to, uh, then what is it we're going to cut back on first? What can we cut back on first? And then also understand that not everything is planned in advance. I, my house got hit by lightning in 2020 and the insurance just, you know, they, they wanted to replace control panels on 20 year old appliances. And it's like, eh. okay, so, Unplanned expenses can come up like a bolt of lightning. All right. Uh, this slide is from the Department of Labor. Every two years, they do a consumer expenditure survey. They grind on it for a year and finally publish it. So this last survey was done in 2021. At some point in 2022, they're going to release the update, and I will update this slide. This doesn't apply to your typical ExxonMobil family, but these are national averages of spending based on the age of the uh, head of household, okay? Um, and so I kind of think of these as people who are I know, if we're thinking Exxon Mobil people, these are people in early retirement. But no, if you think of the national average, these are people just before retirement. These are people early retirement. And these are people later into retirement. And what it's showing is that by category, your spending is going down every place except for healthcare. And this healthcare is basically because at 65, you move on to Medicare. And for most people, Medicare costs them more than what their healthcare package costs them. But not for ExxonMobil people. <laughs> your, your Medicare is going to cost the same or potentially a little bit less than what you're paying for healthcare uh, as an early retiree. Um, but okay, so overall, you changed the head of household age by 10 years and the spending went down by 21% or about 2.3% a year. You get to later in retirement and everything goes down more except healthcare stays about the same. You're still on Medicare. Uh, and so another 21% reduction. Now we never throw those numbers into a plan for somebody uh, unless they've gone through and said, we're gonna reduce these expenditures. So have a lower expenditure for me after 75 or what have you. But this is just evidence of the fact that people do definitely slow down with age. Okay, so basically, what we want to do is build in assumptions about healthcare, and we generally build in the assumption it's going to rise faster than consumer price index does. Uh, almost double consumer price index over the last 20 years. Um, maybe building in contingency for long-term care, that would be things that your health insurance does not cover. Okay, think of your medical insurance as covers things that you're expected to get well and go home. And the long-term care covers, you're never going to get better. You're never going home. Okay, that's kind of the difference between medical insurance and long-term care. Identify your income sources and run the numbers and see if the plan works. So, 
this is like, in my opinion, the one most important slide out of this entire presentation deck. Uh, what are typically the three things that you as an ExxonMobil family member are going to be living on in retirement? So social security, I don't know, it's not number one, it's, it's the smallest of the three, but okay, social security. So in theory, it replaces 90% of your gross income, but that's only if your gross income was kind of minimum wage. For the median income in the US, it's replacing about 40%. And for the typical ExxonMobil employee, it's in the range of replacing 10 to 30% of your gross income. Uh, let's look at it on this slide. As far as I know, we're the only people in the world that show it this way. Uh, that if you plot it as what is your gross income as a percentage of the maximum covered earnings, Okay, which in 2022, the maximum earnings that you pay Social Security tax on is 147,000. So what is your pay as a percentage of that? And what then is it going to give you as an income replacement on your gross income? Okay, so what this is saying is, if you are up to this sort of minimum breakpoint number, which this year is 12,288, it's gonna replace 90%. For the next tranche, it's replacing 32%. So this was asymptote out at 32% if it went for infinity, but it doesn't. It stops right here at what is the median income for the United States, which in current dollars is $74,064. And right at that point is 42%. I rounded it in the previous slide and said about 40%. And then the replacement is 15% for the next tranche. And that tranche ends uh, at this 100% of maximum covered earnings. Okay, so it would asymptote out at 15% if it went forever, but it doesn't. So it stops right there and it's 27%. Uh, now, the majority of the professional population uh, for ExxonMobil is to the right of that, and the executives might be off the curve, okay? Uh, but if they're off the curve, there's still about 10% replacement. And if you're a paraprofessional, you're probably in this range. So that's why I said it's 10 to 30%. So here I just picked the middle of that range and said, let's say that's 20% of your income, the pension. So the pension is gonna replace as little as 12% or as much as 65%. And let's look at kind of how that chart works. So I have two different curves here. One is for somebody who leaves as soon as they've achieved 55 and 15. And the other one is somebody who's a career employee. So these are two totally different curves because this one never gets more than 15 years of experience. Uh, and this one is getting another year of experience every year. So by career employee, I'm assuming this is someone who started as a professional employee at age 22. So they've had 33 years of service by the time they hit age 55. Between 55 and 60, uh, as you know, it's 5% a year haircut uh, for taking the benefit before age 60. It's not for retiring before age 60, it's for taking the benefit before age 60. So it's possible that if you didn't need the money, uh, then you could defer taking the pension benefit until 60 and get the full vested benefit at age 60. Now there's an earlier question that I put off and that is, but what happens if I leave even before 55? Okay.
Okay. So if you look at the summary plan description, uh, the SPD for the pension plan, and, and you look under the section of taking the benefit, and it's going to show you two tables of these haircuts, okay? The one table is if you've achieved retiree status, used to be called annuitant status, but they, they got with the current century and now call it retiree status. So that means you have at least 55 age and 15 years. Then you read off of this table and it's 5% a year. And that continues on down to 50, but only if it was like, a uh, medical reason that you left employment early, okay? You left with disability retirement. Then you can go all the way down to age 50 on that table and it still it's that 5% a year. Okay. And again, the full vested benefit at age 60. Now, if you have not achieved retirement status, retirement eligibility, then you still have a vested benefit. But to get the full vested benefit, you have to be 65 years old, not 60, 65. And the table for haircuts is really, really, really uh, confusing. Okay, now it's not confusing. It's just, it's not easy for me to quote it to you. So it's kind of like you take it as 64, it's a 10% haircut. You take it as 63, it's another nine, another eight, another seven. Anyway, it gets down to really small numbers really quickly. And there is no option for a lump sum. But having said that, uh, the company in its great generosity has been offering lump sums for people who retired in the last couple of years. Now, I don't know they're doing that anymore because, you know, they wanted to get rid of people and now they want to stop people from leaving. Okay. Uh, so a big change of heart that came about there. Uh, but those lump sums they were offering were off of the undiscounted full vested amount. However, assuming you didn't get it till age 60, and this gets into a whole nother range of how do you calculate the lump sum from the annuity that we really just don't have time for. But come back on my how does the discount rate affect the lump sum? And I will be happy to entertain that question. So got uh, a question about can you defer taking your money and defer the interest rate? Okay, the interest rate that applies for, or the discount rate that applies for calculating your lump sum is the discount rate that's in effect on your benefit commencement date full stop. So if you defer your benefit commencement date, you've deferred what interest rate's gonna be applied, okay? And so if you think that we're in a temporary up cycle, but it's going right back down uh, because of, I don't know, fill in the blank, then yeah, you could play that interest rate waiting game and maybe turn out a winner for having done that. Uh, most people's mindset is in a different direction today, but that doesn't mean that that mindset is wrong. Uh, and I'll come back to when would you defer your uh, annuity in a later slot. Uh, so there was a question about what do I think about long-term care? We have an entire seminar on that. Uh, I'm just going to say that if I were trying to sell you a long-term care policy, I would quote the statistic that once you're past the age of 60, you've got a three out of 5% chance. So a 60% probability you will need long-term care at some point in your life. Okay. That really sounds like, yeah, you probably need this insurance. On the other hand, you should ask that insurance salesman, how many people do you know that ever got a dime off of their long-term care policy? And what you would find out is eh, less than half, let alone ever got the premiums back that they paid. So that's, that's a whole seminar. Okay. Um, 
if you defer taking the lump sum, at what point does interest rate and average salary determine? So your average salary that's being used is whatever was your pensionable pay, the highest 36 consecutive months out of the last 10 years of employment. So it's the same number that you had on your day of retirement. The interest rate is the interest rate in effect on the benefit commencement date, whenever that is. Uh, now, if you are over 64, so you're grandfathered from the Pension Protection Act of 2006, all right, there's, there's an asterisk and footnote for you. Uh, but I'm just gonna leave it with the one that applies to almost everybody in the room, if not everybody in the room. All right, so back to this slide that says, okay, our typical career employee, it's replacing the pension. If you think of it as an annuity, and therefore replacement of your gross income, it's replacing about 50% at age 60. I'm saying, well, okay, let's call it 40 because a lot of people are going at 58 years old instead of 60, um, or they didn't quite start at age 22. So, okay, I'm knocking it down. And that means if, if you're gonna spend the same amount in retirement that you need it as gross income while working, then the other 40% has to come from your savings and investment. But I'll also say that you probably don't need 100%. And why don't you need 100%? You don't need 100% because you're no longer paying Social Security, okay, tax. Uh, you're no longer paying Medicare tax. Uh, you're no longer saving for retirement. Okay, so you put in whatever your percentage number is that you're saving for retirement. You put in... 7.65% uh, for Social Security, another 1.5% for Medicare. And, you know, you probably need less than 90% of what your gross was. On the other hand, while you're still young, you're probably going to spend more on travel and entertainment. So, yeah, maybe you do need 100%. Okay. That is everything I had to talk about in the retirement analysis. And let's turn now to investment strategy. Uh, okay. I got another question that came in first. If I retire at age 60, what is the IRS age of mortality for lump sum calculations? Okay. So first, let me say it doesn't quite work that way. So in the webinar that we do on how to discount rates determine my lump sum. I'll go to that in great detail. Um, however, if you've already been there and, and it's like, yeah, yeah, I know that. Just tell me the name. Tell me the age. Okay. So at 60 years old, I would use age 84. Okay. A lot of times I use 85 for illustration because it's a nice around 25 years, but uh, it's between 84 and 85 is what your actuarial life expectancy is uh, at age 60. At age 55, it's about six months less because every year you don't die, you gain about one more month of life expectancy when you're in this age range. As you get older, you gain more than one month of life expectancy for every year that you don't die. Okay, investment strategy. So what I'm showing on this slide is, you know, there's, there's a zillion different investment strategies in the world, but I'm showing kind of the handful that have been found very useful for retirement income planning. And, and the first one from the bottom up is annuities. Now, Generally speaking, if somebody's considering an annuity, we'll, we will encourage them to very strongly consider the company's annuity because it's triple guaranteed. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit more about the other annuity options and why people sometimes pick a different option. Uh, bond ladders, uh, talk about those. It's like the second most secure source of income. Uh, then other income-oriented investments other than bond ladders 
And then the two that most people use are either a fixed asset allocation, which they sometimes gussy it up and call it modern portfolio theory. Uh, come back to that one and dynamic asset allocation. Uh, okay. Yeah, so whatever strategy you pick, uh, you really want to have a strategy that sort of takes the emotion out of it because, you know, emotions of fear and greed are the two things that can really mess up your plan. Uh, they lead to like getting excited and buying at the peak uh, or getting frightened and selling at the bottom. So our process is designed to, to help prevent you from making those mistakes. Uh, building a portfolio is gonna protect you on the downside. Uh, okay, you can read these things. Let me move on to, there are three basic types of annuities. So the one that the company's offering is a fixed annuity. And of course, that's one of the reasons some people don't like it is because Yes, annuity is going to eat away at its value. And yes, that but sounds like a good number of $100,000 a year now. You know, in 30 years, we'll have only $50,000 of buying power. But, uh, but still, let's run the plan on an annuity and a lump sum basis and see what the differences are so that you can understand how that's actually going to work out for you or not work out for you as the case may be. Okay, so it's most like putting your money in bank CDs. That's kind of the rate of return you're going to expect to get. And if this you buy a fixed annuity from an insurance company, it's held in the general fund. Okay, so basically you don't own those individual assets and your ups and downs are not based on those individual assets. Uh, jump over here to variable annuities. So these were kind of invented in the 1970s because with high inflation, nobody wanted a fixed annuity product anymore. So they came up with this um, and it's, it's more like owning mutual funds and you're, you have them in a separate account. So generally you can choose what mutual funds you want in your variable annuity. And the rate of return you're going to get is whatever the market gives you. Now, the thing about variable annuities is that the annuity companies are really, really good at coming up with the bells and whistles that just sound wonderful to people like guaranteed lifetime income for just a small rider. And so, once you're paying all these rider means fee, by the way. So once you pay all these extra riders, uh, then that's chipping away your market return. And yeah, you know, most of the world got disenchanted with variable annuities over the years. So the insurance companies came back with what probably is the best for most people in the current world. It's a hybrid between getting market returns and getting a fixed return. It basically is going to give you like a percent of the market with a cap and a floor. So the floor might be zero. You'll never lose money. Uh, the cap might be, I don't know, 10%. Okay. So if the market went up 20%, you're only going to get a percentage of that anyway, maybe 75%, but even 75% of, of 20%, that's pretty good but you got a cap of 10. Okay, so, so you're getting somewhere between the zero and 10 every year. And a lot of people are perfectly happy with, as long as they're not losing money, uh, and as long as they have this potential of getting more, that's good enough, okay? It's also held in a general fund. So what does this matter? This matters if the insurance company goes bankrupt, because, you know, it's like annuities are guaranteed. Who are they guaranteed by? They're guaranteed by the insurance company you bought them from. Okay, so if they go bankrupt, well, you know, lots of luck for the general fund. 
But the news is they don't often go bankrupt. So even like AIG went bankrupt in 2008, taken over by the government, uh, but its life and annuity business was perfectly healthy. You know, this corporate separatist stuff, it actually works. Um, so it worked in the favor of people who had AIG uh, life insurance and annuities, and they now have Sun Life life insurance and annuities. So, okay, uh, enough about annuities, because again, I said, if you're thinking about annuity, I'm going to strongly recommend that you consider the one that the company's offering. Okay, so the next thing up was bond ladders. And no one would have a three rung three year bond ladder. Okay. Uh, but to illustrate it and make it legible, I'm illustrating it with three rung three year bond ladders. So when you first get in, you're going to buy a one year bond, a two year bond, then a three year bond. And as the one year bond matures, you're going to buy a three year bond. When the two year bond matures, you're going to buy a three year bond. When the three year bond matures, you're going to buy a three year bond. So every year you have a bond maturing and every year all three of these bonds are paying interest rates. And the risk of bonds is that when interest rates change, if interest rates go up, the value of the bond goes down. But if you hold the bond to maturity, you don't care. You're going to get the money back. Assuming the person who issued the bond did not go bankrupt. Okay. So we got that nasty bankruptcy word in here again. The problem is interest rates have been so low for so long. I don't have not one single client who is depending on a bond ladder for income. I have some clients who have bond ladders for other reasons that kind of drove them into, you know, a bond ladder makes the most sense for this. But, uh, but for income, it's almost all dividend stocks these days. So, so basically, if you look at the yields, uh, so I updated this a couple of weeks ago, and you know you can look at iShares bond ladders for Treasury bonds. They illustrate a bond ladder giving one point five seven percent for corporate bonds two point three eight. If you're willing to go to high yield bonds, which is a euphemism for what's commonly called junk bonds. Uh, you might get four and a quarter, okay? Um, if you look at different income funds, uh, AAA bonds at 20 years, three and a quarter, 4.4 for the lower quality uh, B-grade bonds. High yield is lower quality than that, by the way. So high, how is this higher than this? Well, this is a 20-year bond, and this is a ladder of short to long-term bonds. Okay, you can find flexible income funds, mortgage bonds, foreign bonds. Then I give you what are the, uh, the, the couple of mutual funds that I got these yields out of. Preferred stock, royalty trusts. And again, I gave you the couple of uh, ticker symbols that are paying these kind of dividends. Uh, so dividend stocks. So you can get some really high quality dividend stocks at 3%. Uh, you can get some of these beaten up uh, oil related, mostly pipeline stocks that have these higher returns. Uh, this was the 10 year treasury. Boy, it's gone up in a couple of weeks, hasn't it? Okay, anyway, so that gives you just an idea of the kind of yields. Um, so I wanna give you an illustration. When I was a puppy with Exxon, one of the old guys took me aside and said, Kenor, let me tell you how you're going to do this. Uh, in your savings plan, put everything in ExxonMobil stock. And when you retire, you take the annuity and you'll find that between the annuity and the dividends on your ExxonMobil stock, you'll have more money than you had while you were working. And I've actually had people who uh, are clients that retired with that strategy, by the way. Um, and uh, that old guy was right. That, that strategy would have worked. Um, so what this is illustrating here, though, is if in 2000, you put $100,000 in ExxonMobil stock versus $100,000 in what we call our prime income portfolio. So that's a portfolio of the higher dividend paying stocks. 
and you did not reinvest the dividends. You're retired now, you're living off of those dividends, okay? So in 2000, I can clearly remember ExxonMobil dividend being 2%, you know? Uh, when, when we'd spend weekends on the internet reading all the comments about the merger, and every now and then somebody would make a comment about the stock. I remember somebody commenting about how crappy 2% was and somebody else saying, yeah, but if you bought your stocks in 1980. <laughs> okay, so it was 2% yield at the time and that dividend has gone up every single year. Uh, and on ExxonMobil's website, they tell you that the dividend payments grown in an annual compounded return of 6% over the last 39 years. So it's definitely more than kept up with inflation. Uh, and then here is our prime income portfolio. So it was paying a little bit over 4% back then. So you got a little over $4,000 for your $100,000 investment. And it's not one stock. It's not even the same two dozen stocks every year and blah, blah, blah. So sometimes the dividends actually go down like they did from 2008 to 2009 or like they did from 2019 to 2020. But over time, they definitely are going up as well at, you know, something akin. Now, this is 29 years and this is only 20, or just 39 years and this is only 20 years. So, you know, they're not exactly comparable numbers but you get the idea. Dividends tend to go up faster than inflation. And I have some records that I could take you all the way back into the 1950s and track this and see that, yeah, this is a, this is a long-term trend that dividends tend to go up faster than inflation. So if you have a fixed annuity and you got a dividend stream of income and that's enough income for you, uh, at retirement is probably going to be enough income for you for the rest of your life. Okay. But now let's move on to more like what most people do. And, and I have to say that a fixed asset allocation is what most people do. They gussy it up and they call it modern portfolio theory. Modern means the 1950s. Somehow, every time I think of modern portfolio theory, I, I see an orange naga hide sofa in somebody's living room. Uh, and the, the people who develop modern portfolio theory, brilliant guys, you know, they, they got Nobel prizes for it and all, uh, but they would tell you it was never designed to be used to manage a portfolio. It's only there to help you think about diversification and risk. Okay, and why is that? Because to use modern portfolio theory, you need to know the cross correlation coefficients among all the different asset classes in your model. Not last year's correlation, next year's correlation. Okay, you use last year's correlation and it's gonna tell you what was the best portfolio to have had last year. That's not very useful. You want to know what's the best one to have for next year, and they can't do that. So anybody who charges you a fee and says they're using modern portfolio theory, they either don't know what the heck they're talking about, or they do. And I'm not sure which of those two is scary. So, okay, this is not exactly modern portfolio theory that I'm illustrating here. I took an idea that Paul Merriman put in his uh, retirement book, Live It Up Without Outliving Your Money. And I'm plotting the worst 12 months against the average year for different mixtures of the aggregate bond fund. So this would be like bond units in the uh, savings plan. Okay, it's just following what is now the Barclay Capital Aggregate Bond Fund. Uh, and 100% stock fund, which would be like equity units. So this is just like the S&P 500 index that's being used here. And what you see is that the lowest risk does not occur at 100% bonds. That adding a little bit of stock 
to a bond fund up to about 40% will actually lower the risk of loss in any given year. This is not a law of finance. It just has to do with how the business cycle operates and when is it that interest rates tend to go up, therefore bond funds lose money. And when is it that interest rates tend to go down, therefore bond funds make more money. These average returns are just for this particular period of 1980 to 2020. So again, this is not able to predict the future. It's only able to tell you, well, this is kind of what's happened in the past, okay? And so this then would be your most conservative portfolio that you would want to consider, not this. And as you add more stock beyond this point, well, the risk goes up. At 60% stock, it has about the same risk as 100% bond fund, but a lot more fun than 100% bond fund. Um, as you go up beyond that point, you're now getting really a lot more risk per unit of gain on the return. Uh, and so for retirement, the sweet spot is somewhere between the 40 and the 60. That's where you find most people. Uh, okay, so there's a question about this international assets figure into this. And I think they mean this particular chart that I'm showing. So this is not modern portfolio theory. This is just illustrating kind of stock versus bond. And all of this is domestic. This is the S&P 500 domestic. This is the aggregate bond index domestic. Uh, so bringing international into it is really interesting. Love to talk about it, but I'm not really set up to do that in this presentation. So, okay, this is what most people do. And the only sort of uh, delta off of that would be dynamic asset allocation. Oh, I think before I go there, I should say, it's not obvious here. So I need to state it, that basically this assumes that at least once a year, you're going to rebalance because seven years out of 10, the stock fund is going to grow a lot more than the bond fund did. And you're no longer going to be at whatever balance you pick. I like to pick 50-50 for an illustration because it's the easiest to do the math in your head. So one's bigger than the other, you're no longer at 50-50. Okay, so you would need to rebalance. And that just means selling some of the bigger one and buying some of the smaller one to get it back into balance. And why do you need to do that so your risk doesn't drift uh, and become riskier and riskier and riskier as the market goes up, 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 up? And then, of course, the market will crash someday, and now you'll be not taking enough risk. Okay. So, uh, so okay. So, what does dynamic asset allocation mean? Well, first, first, what's the motivation? So the start of the 20th century, railroad stocks were about two thirds of the US equity market. And, you know, 100 years later, less than 1%. Russia, India, and Austria-Hungary together were 25% of the global equity market in 1899. It sounds like the start of the 20th century. But anyway, and less than 1% a century later. So, you know, things change. And, and therefore, you know, basically taking a buy and hold is not, not necessarily going to work over the long term. But however, most people who are recommending a buy and hold strategy are not necessarily saying buy these five stocks and hold them. They're saying buy an index fund like the S&P 500. And there's 500 stocks in the S&P 500, but it's not always the same 500. So there's a committee out there who's deciding who deserves to be in this and who deserves to be booted out of this. Uh, it's not just simple arithmetic. And so 
I take what this page says with a little grain of salt, uh, but you know, yeah, okay, it's a good perspective. Uh, what's the other thing? The other thing is that sometimes markets crash for years. You know, they're not all March 2020 events where two months later, everything is in correction mode. Um, so like from 1881 to 1885, a 36% decline. Uh, 1929 to 1932, an 86% decline. That's, that's the worst on record, yeah. Okay, but you've got this happening in 09, 19, 29, 39. It's like people were really convinced every 10 years, okay? Then, of course, it happened in 1946. 1946? Well, anyway, okay. And then we didn't have one in the 50s, okay? And the next multi-year crash was 68 to 70, 72 to 74. I know there was another crash in the late 70s, but it was not a multi-year crash. There's a double dip recession in 1982. Uh, there was that one day collapse in 1987, but we're just looking at multi-year declines. Why? Because in a multi-year decline, you might be very much not in the mood to take some of your safe money in the bond fund and be buying stock with it and having that go down more. Okay, and so, there is some incentive to consider deviations from just a fixed asset allocation. Um, and that would be not trying to time the market, okay? And not just responding after the market did, <laughs> but basically watching the flow of funds, uh, seeing as cash is accumulating over here, uh, seeing as cash is flowing from domestic to international and recognizing that these flows of funds are basically responding to any number of things that could be affecting the market. Way too many for you to try to model, considering that you can build all kinds of models that work looking backwards, but you have no idea if they're going to work looking forwards until after the fact again. Uh, so, okay, so then you would rank your assets based on relative strength and align your allocation to the strongest asset classes. And again, I want to say, if you're just doing this with 2020 hindsight, it's going to slam you. I can pretty much tell you that. But here's an illustration of, again, kind of the basis for dynamic asset allocation. What this is doing, I know it's too small to read, but you can see the colors and at the top of each, each of these are years from 2002 to 2021. And the top row is always the thing that gave the best return that year. And the bottom row is the one that did the worst, either lost the most money or, you know, sometimes the bottom row is still positive. You know, like these are money market funds here in the blue, okay? Um, so even in 2003, 2004, they were the worst performing, but they were positive. All right. And you can see things like, you know, here, emerging markets lost 6%. The next year, they're up 55, and then 25, and then 34, and 32, and almost 40. And then look at this, minus 53. So if you're doing everything, just looking in the rear view mirror and trend following, Mm, not necessarily going to work. But, you know, if you're looking at other indicators to, to tell you when would you prefer domestic, when would you prefer international. So, for example, when the dollar is strengthening, uh, then that generally means that the domestic U.S. stock market is going to do better uh, than the developed international. Doesn't really tell you a lot about uh, versus emerging market. Okay, so those are the five, the handful of different investment strategies. And now they're with their all strategies. So like I said, when I'm working with a client on their individual portfolio, I'm usually saying, let's talk about withdrawal strategy first. 
and see which of these might work for you because that's going to back us into which investment strategies are more likely to work with that income strategy. So the income only strategy is a strategy that uh, guarantees you'll never run out of money. And it guarantees that because you promise you'll never sell anything. You're just going to live off of the dividends and interest that are created. And that's going to drive you to those things like bond ladders, those other income funds that I showed you, dividend paying stocks that we went through. Jump to the other extreme, systematic withdrawals. Systematic withdrawals will give you a lot more flexibility in your spending because most people are not willing to contain their spending to what this will give them in terms of income. So this gives you a lot more. Uh, maneuverability in, in your withdrawals, okay? So that means it does not guarantee you're not going to run out of money. We need some other approach for that. But to imagine it, let's go to that really nice, easy to think about 50-50 stocks and bonds. I got 50% in a stock index fund. I got 50% in a bond index fund. Every month I need some money. All I have to do is see which one of these two is bigger. That's the one I get my money out of. And if taking my money out of that one, the bigger one all the time, does not keep them in balance, keep them at right about 50-50, then every now and then I will sell some of the bigger and buy some of the smaller to get them back to 50-50. If you can follow the religion of doing that, it will guarantee you, you will never sell the top of the market because you're selling all the way up. And it will guarantee that, I'm sorry, you'll never buy at the top of the market because you're selling all the way up. You'll never sell at the bottom of the market because again, if you're rebalancing to keep things at 50-50, you would be buying all the way down. Every now and then you run into a short period of time when everything is going down. And that's kind of when you wish that you had a different approach, like a bucket approach that had a bucket that's just cash. <laughs> so that, you know, you run into a one month or three month period of time when everything's going down, that you don't have to sell anything for your monthly distributions. And you can kind of wait till the ugliness is over. That doesn't happen very often. It happened though in September, uh, 2008, in the middle of a panic. It happened in March, 2020, in the middle of a panic. It happened in the first three months of 2022. In the middle of a, I don't know what to call what's happened in the last three months. Might be over though. Okay, so because it does not guarantee you're not going to run out of money, you have to have sort of another way. And of course, we can update your financial plan every year if you're with us. But if you're not with us, you have to have another way that's going to quickly tell you, am I going to run out of money? So this chart is the one that does it. Uh, people look at this and say 2% inflation. Who are you kidding? And I say that doesn't matter. What matters is the difference between these two numbers. As long as you're getting a 3% real rate of return, you're going to get the answers of running out of money at the same point. 43 years, 29 years, 22 years, 18 years. Let me prove that to you. Uh, so here it is at 5% inflation. The shapes of the curves are massively different because of the illusion that inflation creates about your money. But 4% line, you're gonna run out in 42 to 43 years, 5%, 29, 22, 18, okay? They're exactly the same points with a 5% inflation, but a 3% real rate of return. And if you compare these numbers with what was in the earlier chart, it compares pretty well in terms of in higher inflation periods of time, you're gonna get 
higher returns. Not everybody agrees with what I just said. So happy to have a longer conversation about that one-on-one. -on -one. So, okay, uh, that is basically all of the first three topics. And, and the rest of this talks about, well, okay, but what else changes as things go on? Like you have required minimum distributions and they're going to, they start now at 72 and it's on this table. So you start at less than 4% and you're going up, 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 up. By the time you're in your 90s, it's 10% a year that you have to withdraw from 401ks and IRAs. And if you're not dead yet, congratulations, it keeps going up until it hits 50%. Uh, but yeah, nobody lives to 120. So, so basically, this is an example of somebody that as soon as they started required minimum distributions, uh, that's the green bar. The black is their total spending, including taxes. The jump up in the spending is because their taxes went up. Okay. And so this kind of gives the incentive for somebody to look at things like tax optimization by planning Roth conversions. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that we do in step four of, you know, kind of monitoring and optimizing as things go along. Uh, another thing you monitor and optimize is your tax planning. What kind of uh, assets do you pull out first? What do you save to last? And that's also a tax optimization kind of strategy. And and a lot of times we're working off of this game of your ordinary income tax is never lower than 10. And your capital gains rate, if you were in the 10 or 12, is zero. That's my favorite tax rate. Okay. And then it goes up to 15 if you were in the 22 or 24. It goes up to 18.8, .8, somewhere between the 24 and the 32. And if you're right up here in these top two tax brackets, it could go up all the way to 23.8, but it's always a substantial savings. And so playing that game of uh, ordinary income versus capital gains is, is part of the process. So I'm going a little faster here because I realize I'm like over time and, and losing people. Uh, so, uh, let me just draw to a conclusion. I think you need a plan. And I love for us to be the people who help you with that. Uh, you don't have to only pick one person to do a plan. Pick a few. Uh, see which ones make the most sense to you. Who has a more transparent fee structure? Who seems to be more qualified and understand your employment plan? Uh, and basically, bottom line, when they talk, who do you understand? Okay. Um, so instead of talking about upcoming events, I'll basically just tell you, go to Bogart Wealth under resources, events, video events, uh, or just go exactly to Bogart Wealth video events. We post, I have not updated this in a while. We post uh, these presentations so you can watch them again and again. Um, or you can kind of get a preview of one to see if it's worth an hour of your time. If you want to sign up for future events, right here, subscribe for premium content. Just ask for a name and an email, not even a phone number. No one will call you. Okay. If you go instead to the Contact Us page, um, all right, we're asking for a phone number. But if you put down here in the notes, don't call me. I just want XYZ. Uh, we'll just give you XYZ. Trust me. Okay, so thanks for attending, and these are the contact numbers for the advisors and also for uh, my associate, Mindy Harbor, for any follow-up. I'll leave that slide up for just a minute, and I'll wait to see if there's any more questions that come up, but otherwise, that's all I had for today. Thank you for the feedback. 
Okay, folks, it'll be up on the website in probably a couple of weeks. So, uh, so you can see it there. Bye-bye.